Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and on today's video we'll be taking a look at possibly one of the best value for money budget boards for the B650 platform for modern AM5 processors. This is ASRock's B650M HDV slash M.2, and it is somewhat of a corker. I really like this board, so we're going to go through today, do a quick unboxing, go through, show you all the ports, talk about some of the features, uh, some of the pros and cons. There are some slight cons to this board, uh, they're not particularly dramatic. And for probably a good percentage of you, it isn't going to make any difference whatsoever, but we'll come to that a little bit later on. So do stay tuned to find out more as far as that goes. So we're going to go through today, take a look at the packaging, all that kind of good stuff. And then at the end of the video, obviously you can make up your own mind whether or not this is going to be suitable for your next budget build, or potentially even for a slightly more high-end build. Due to ASRock actually implementing some pretty decent VRMs on this, in comparison with other boards of a similar price point, this can actually take and use quite easily the latest and greatest AM5 processors, even the 7950X, and do all core loads without melting. So that is absolutely great. There was a fantastic video from Steve over at Hardware Unboxed who went into great depth doing some VRM testing. So I'll try and link that video in the video description as well. So if you want to know a little bit more about the VRM side of things, that video might be useful to you. But if you want to find out about all the connectivity and all the slots on the board, then keep watching. So we're going to start with the packaging, and as you've possibly noticed already, this packaging is uh, slightly beaten up. This was actually an Amazon warehouse deal. Unfortunately, this board, although it was touted as being one of the original $125 boards, which AMD announced, sadly, that is no longer the case. Things have changed, and things are becoming more expensive, especially for people in the UK and in Europe. You should expect to find this on sale for somewhere around the £140 mark. I actually picked this up as an Amazon used deal for just slightly under that, about 135. So I think it's actually a pretty decent value for money proposition, as long as you don't mind a, a little bit of a ropey packaging. But it says what it is on there, so B650 MHDV M.2, supports DDR5, also supports PCI Express Gen 5. You've got HDMI outputs and DisplayPort outputs, and it's using the B650 chipset. So much better than using the A-Class chipset, which you don't have any overclocking or any options to kind of tweak settings a little bit. So this is a preferable option, in my opinion. On the back of the box, it goes over some of the key features and specifications. So I'll give you a close-up of those. Again, some of the key features. So the VRM, you've got DRMOS Vichy 50 amp VRM setup on there in an 8 plus 2 plus 1 configuration. We've also got DDR5 memory support up to 96 gigabytes across two slots and currently supporting DDR5 speeds up to 7200 mega transfers per second or megahertz, however you want to look at it. Also, you do have pre-installed IO shield, which is always a nice thing to have on a slightly more budget board. You've got blazing M.2, which doesn't mean it's going to catch on fire. It just means that it's particularly fast. So you've got PCI Express Gen 5 on the top slot. And in the second slot, which again is a slightly unusual thing to get on slightly smaller boards, you've got PCI Express Gen 4x4. Also, as part of the B650 chipset, there is also 2.5 gigabit LAN, which is becoming more and more popular. And certainly for us here in the MUB household, I make use of 2.5 gigabit every single day, transferring lots of big data files and video files and that kind of stuff. So yeah, when you have to go back down to one gigabit, it is not particularly great. There is also an option on this board as well for a Wi-Fi slot, should you want to go down the Wi-Fi route. I've actually installed one myself, you'll probably see some B-roll of this. This is one we picked up ages ago, so there is a E-type slot for M.2 devices, so you can add Bluetooth and also Wi-Fi, and you can choose the Wi-Fi basically if you're choosing, depending on what you want to spend and what you need, you can pick a M.2 E-key, which will be suitable for your needs. I'll put a link for the one that we've bought in the video description. So before we take a look at the motherboard itself, let's go through some of the included accessories, of which there are basically none. It's very, very minimal affair. You do, however, get Wi-Fi antennas if you buy the Wi-Fi version. There are two versions available. You can get one with a pre-installed Wi-Fi chip. The one we've got here, which is the HDV slash M.2, doesn't include it as standard. So just to clarify that for anyone who's looking at this and thinking, oh great, it's got Wi-Fi. It hasn't got Wi-Fi as standard. This is something I've added after the fact, so do please bear that in mind. You do also get a user manual, which uh, isn't always a given these days. Generally, it's going to be some sort of QR code, so it's nice that that is included. There's also a couple of screws as well for mounting M.2 drives, so you get two of those included. Another thing you get is a couple of SATA cables, nothing too spectacular, one straight and one with a right angle connection, which can be connected to any of the four SATA ports on the board. 
Okay then, let's take a look and see what connectivity we've got on this board. So we'll start up in the top corner. So we've got a single 8-pin EPS connection there for connecting up EPS power cables. Next to that, there is a very small and somewhat wobbly VRM heatsink. Uh, the little one at the top is just on one of those spring-loaded connections, so yeah, no worries there. It makes ample contact, so don't worry about that at all. On the left-hand side, we've got this larger VRM heatsink for the main set there. It doesn't actually cover as much as you think it would, so if I give you some views, you can probably see underneath there is a, a big gap under there, so it's not as huge as you'd expect, but certainly seems to do a good job, and in Steve's testing at Hardware Unboxed, they found the VRM temperatures, even with extreme loads running Cinebench for an hour, was absolutely fine with no throttle in, so you've got no issues there. So don't be too concerned that it isn't an overly elaborate affair. It does the job excellently. Moving across in the central position here, we have got our AM5 socket. So as it stands at the moment currently, this supports all of the AM5 processors on the market, which at the time of recording starts off at the humble 7500F and goes up to the 7950. So yeah, no problems for those at all. You will, however, need a BOSS update for some of the lower end chips. The 7500F actually does require a BOSS update. If you're not too sure which BOSS version is actually on your board, don't worry, ASRock are pretty cool with that. They actually stamp on the little BOSS chip, which is down here, there's a sticker, so I'll give you a close-up of that. And it tells you the actual BOSS revision, which is installed on the board from the factory. So at a glance, you can tell whether or not it's gonna be compatible. If you're not too sure what processor is compatible with the board, I'll put some links again in the video description which will go directly to all of the CPUs listed and also the minimum BIOS support required for the individual processor. So moving back to the top here, so there is a CPU header that is for your fans. With ASRock boards, pretty decent fan control and all of the ports on here, of which there are four in total, all can be used in various configurations. So whether it's CPU fan, case fan, water pump, AIO, all that kind of stuff, you can configure those in the BIOS. And also we will be doing a BOSS tour of this board and also a BOSS flashback. So if there's anything you need to know about this board, we should have it covered in one of the three videos. Moving across on the other side of the memory slots, of which there are only two, sadly. That is one of the downsides of this, although saying that you still can get up to 96 gigabytes of RAM on here, over two 48 gig sticks. Moving down, so you've got our 24 pin main power connector of which that is the one you'll need to connect up if you're doing your BOSS flash before build. You don't need the EPS one, just the 24 pin for BOSS flashing on this board. Underneath that, USB type C front panel header connector. Always good to see those. And underneath that, there's actually a pair of USB 3.0 type A ports. So you can put two ports on there, two on there, and one is facing outward, one is facing that way. So depending on your setup, you may find it slightly easier for cable management. Or maybe you've got a flashy case where you've actually got more than two USB 3.0 ports, so you can connect those up without having to worry about an additional daughter board. Underneath that, we've got four SATA ports for connecting up SATA drives, either hard disk drives or SSDs. This section here, this is the heatsink for the B650 chipset. Moving across from there, there is a TPM header, so if you want to install a TPM device, you certainly can do. Don't have to. TPM is actually built into the processors as a firmware TPM, so potentially you might want to use that. Some businesses will, most people will never use it at all. Underneath that, so we've got our front panel connections there, so for your power button, your reset button, all that kind of stuff. Next up, there is a CMOS reset button as well, so if you dial in some settings whilst you're overclocking and it doesn't quite work out for you, because the battery is actually underneath the PCI Express slot, you don't necessarily have to remove the battery in order to clear the CMOS. You can just do it from those two pins there at the bottom. And one of the nicest features of this board is the fact it has got a diagnostic LED. So if you're having problems with the system not posting properly, you can refer to these lights to see what the problem is, either CPU, RAM, VGA, or your boot device. Moving across a little bit further, so we've got a pair of USB 2.0 front panel connectors there. So four USB ports. Moving up very slightly, Again, Hyper M.2, so this is PCI Express Gen 4 times 4 and you can attach that. No heat sink on that unfortunately, which is a little bit of a shame. And actually going back up, so we've got our PCI Express Gen 4 times 16 slot here at the top with the steel armor. And above that, this M.2 slot, which has currently got a shield over it, you're probably seeing some footage with it removed as well. That will actually do PCI Express Gen 5 times 4 directly from your CPU. Moving back down, so we've got our CR2032 CMOS battery there. So again, if you do want to reset the BIOS or if something goes horrifically wrong and you can't reset it from the two pins there, you can remove the battery, disconnect the power, 
and leave it off for a little while and generally most settings will be lost. We've also got a PCI Express Gen 4 by one slot there. So maybe useful for some other cards, maybe a 2.5 gig LAN card if you want another one for connecting up something or other. And at the bottom there, you have a PCI Express Gen 4 times 16 size slot, but it's only wired for PCI Express Gen 4x4. This is actually gonna be great. So if you've maybe got a graphics card in here, but you also want to put in something like an Elgato capture card, you can put it in there and it's got plenty of bandwidth to do that. So moving on, we've got another two of our fan headers. So that makes up the fourth. So you've got one, two, three, four. So CPU header there, chassis fan header there, or water pump. And at the bottom, another two fan ones just there and there. So nicely spread out. Next up, you've got a weird connection there, and that is for an external Thunderbolt port. So you can buy an additional aftermarket section to enable Thunderbolt support. And next to that, there is something which looks a lot like an addressable RGB connection. But unfortunately, as I said at the very beginning of the video, there are some downsides of this board. And for me personally, well, it's potentially a downside. It may be, it may not be. There isn't actually any addressable RGB or RGB on this board whatsoever. Not supported in the slightest. So for some people, that's going to be a, a great thing because it's just something else you don't have to worry about. And possibly for other people, if you're maybe into a different ecosystem altogether, maybe the Corsair ecosystem, Steel Series, Razer, etc., then you can still install those pieces of software and control things, but you just won't be able to control anything from the board or any headers because there simply aren't any. That one there that looks like a three pin header, which I'm almost 100% sure that in the coming weeks, months, and years, there are going to be people that see that three pin port and try to plug in their RGB and find that things go badly wrong. So, Please, if you're buying this board, do not use the UART connection at the bottom for addressable RGB. It is not for that purpose, although the ports or the pins are exactly the same. This is for, well, it's basically for the manufacturer to program the board rather than you plugging in RGB. I'm interested to see what happens if I do plug in some RGB into there. I might do it and use this board as an expensive donor to see what happens. Hopefully, nothing will happen, but potentially, you could damage the board, so do bear that in mind. Uh, next up, you've got your audio front panel connector. Audio on here, nothing particularly outrageous. It is a Realtek ALC897 chipset. It can support 7.1 audio over analog outputs, although there's only three on the back, so you will need to use the front panel audios from there to create that same setup. But otherwise, for most people, for gaming, etc., it's absolutely fine. Moving across, now again, this is an M.2 Wi-Fi slot. You can put M.2 cards in here, M.2 type E slot. This is one that I've added myself. This does not come included with the motherboard. The one that I've installed is an Intel one and supports Wi-Fi 5 and also Bluetooth. But I just wanted to put it in there to show you how it works. Basically, you put it in there, run the cables up through the back, underneath the heat sink, and then that connects up to the back. These are included with the M.2 card. They are not, I repeat, not included with the motherboard. So normally you'll see these basically empty. You'll see some B-roll of that as it comes out of the factory. So I have added that as an additional thing. That was something I paid for extra. So please, please, if you're about to comment on it, it doesn't come with the board. I can't stress that enough. Talking of the board, let's take a look at the back and see what we've got going on here. So you've got your display port output and also HDMI. Now, as it stands at the moment, the onboard graphics with the current range of AM5 processors is awful. It is, uh, I think it's like Radeon 2 or 3 cores. It's essentially for a desktop display and that is kind of it. It doesn't do any 3D work whatsoever, or at least it, it kind of can do, but extremely poorly. A very, very ba bad setup altogether. But you can use those if you want to. There should, in the near future, be some really good APUs coming out, at which point this board is going to actually start making a ton more sense. So you get a nice cheap board, nice little APU, and run your games. But those processors currently aren't available. So at the moment, these are kind of irrelevant. But anyway, they are there should you need them in the future. So one display port and one HDMI port. Next up, something which is going to be really important going forward is the BOSS flashback button. This is going to be pretty much on every board these days. So if you buy a newer processor, you can flash the BIOS without actually having a working system. This is excellent. We will be doing a full review and guide on how to do that. There is next that USB 2.0 ports. You've got four of those. The bottom one is actually the BIOS flashback port. So if you're doing a flashback, put your card in there or your USB stick in there and you can flash from there. So yeah, four USB 2.0s. 
you've got a USB type C. Unfortunately, the back one is only five gigabit per second, as are the additional two type A's next to it. So only three of the faster ports there. Above that, you've got the Dragon 2.5 gigabit LAN, and you've got your three audio outputs. A pretty meager affair, not a lot here, but for all intents and purposes, if you're just playing games, that is more than enough. So USB 2s are gonna be fine. Keyboard, mouse, joypad, you're off to the races. For those of you that are wondering, with the USB BOSS flashback ports, I do get asked this actually quite a lot, can you use it as a normal USB port? Yes, you can. When it's not being used as a BOSS flashback port, this functions as an absolutely normal standard USB 2 port. So I think that pretty much wraps up the IO. Let's uh, finalize and wrap this up. So there you go, that is the ASRock B650M HDV slash M.2. I've got to be honest, this is a great little board. I'm very pleased I've got it. The downside of not having the addressable RGB ports on there is something which I am slightly kind of aware of and I wouldn't say concerned, but it is one of those things that can catch people out. I imagine there's going to be a lot of people that are building systems, putting this together and they've got their nice case and they've got their Corsair lighting or perhaps not Corsair, but some of the other brands where they just use a standard three pin, five volt addressable RGB and they've got their build together and they're like, right, okay, where do I plug it in? That I feel is going to cause problems, especially if you plug it into that port down the bottom, which is the UART port, which is for programming. Things could go really badly wrong, especially if it's a powered connector coming from some sort of hub. So I'm hoping and praying I don't have to answer those questions, but I feel I might. I think it would have been better to then maybe just blank that off or put a cover over it or something. Yeah, it is going to be something which is going to creep up and kick people in the butt. But other than that, I think the board is absolutely great. It offers PCI Express Gen 5 for your M.2, which is pretty important. I don't think it's as important to have PCI Express Gen 5 slots for the graphics card because those are still gonna be ridiculously expensive. And at the time of recording, they aren't even on the market or even being talked about. So that's a long way off in the future. But in terms of the actual M.2 storage, PCI Express Gen 5 drives are on the market. So potentially you could take advantage of those. Having two slots as well is really nice and actually having the top graphics card slot in the higher position is great for airflow when you're putting this into a micro ATX case. So I think they've worked out the actual positioning very well. Actually having the full size as well at the bottom, very useful indeed. Two RAM slots, not the end of the world. I think 32 gigs of RAM is gonna be fine and most DDR5 on the market at the moment is 32 gigs, or at least that seems to be the most popular in terms of pricing and performance. But yeah, overall, I think this is a great board. I'm very much looking forward to doing a build on it, which we'll be doing in the coming up video. So if you want to see how that goes, make sure you're subscribed to the channel, click on the dingling bell and all that kind of stuff, and you'll be notified of future video releases. So I think that's going to pretty much wrap things up. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video. If you have, smash the like button. If you want to find out more about what we do here at Mike's Unboxing, click on subscribe and the channel notification, and you'll see our released videos. If you've got any questions about this board itself, feel free to knock yourself out in the comments section below or join us on our Discord. But for now, I've been Mike. This is Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and hopefully we'll catch you in the very next video. Thanks for watching.